who, that's who I'm siding with. All right. I'm, si- I'm siding with Jesus too. Don't get all spiritual on us. <laughs> Daggummit, Carla. Of course we're siding with Jesus, but also Travis Kelsey and the rest of the Chiefs. I'm okay with the rest of them too. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm going to make my Super Bowl prediction. You ready? Here's my prediction. The team tonight that will win the Super Bowl, are you ready? I mean, mark this down. This is epic. I am telling you, shush, shush, you're just salty because the bills aren't in it. Here's, Here's my guaranteed prediction. The team that will win tonight is the team that can consistently carry the ball down the field in a consistent manner. That is the team that is going to win. Am I wrong? I'm totally right. Moving the ball down the field is the goal, right? I promise you tonight that when Travis Kelsey makes contact with the ball, he will not just sit where he finds it. He will not sit down. The goal is forward momentum. That's the goal of the game. Either team, whichever one of these teams, the good one or the other one, whichever one of these teams that can make consistent progress down the field over and over again, that is the team that's going to win, right? Okay, I've never got to preach in a sweatshirt before. And I'm actually kind of hot and regret this decision right now. Running, running the ball, that's the goal. Making forward progress and moving, moving, having momentum in what we do, that's the goal. That's why this is our fourth core value for Lifestream Church. Here's our core value. Spiritual growth is healthy. Spiritual stagnation leads to death. Spiritual growth is healthy. Am I right? Spiritual growth is healthy. As much as we, we're clinging to that mission statement, we are people helping people find and follow Jesus. As important as it is to help people find Jesus, man, we can't stop there, right? We cannot stop there. We don't just sit down with the ball and help you find Jesus and drop you off. The goal is forward movement, progress in the same direction over and over again. That's, that's why that's our core value. Most of the people that you meet in, our, in Franklin County, they will be people that at some point or another probably did meet Jesus. Yeah, I mean, just really, realistically, we are in kind of the lower portion of the Bible belt. I think we are. We're this close to Springfield. We're, at, we're in the Bible belt. Um, this, lots of churches in the area, lots of churches in our state, in our community. Most people that you meet will have had an encounter with Jesus at some point in their life. But what changed? It's stopping. It's not having consistent forward momentum that leads them to spiritual growth. And so we're not going to just simply help people find Jesus. We want to help them follow Jesus because spiritual growth matters. Let's just review. Would you say it with me one more time? What is our mission? We are people helping people find and follow Jesus. Our first core value, biblical teaching is foundational. It's foundational to everything we do. Core value number two, relationships transform us. They do. Have you ever been, like, had a relationship that you, like, that person really just poured into your life and invested in your life? Relationships can transform us. Last week, we talked about kids and youth matter. Why do they matter to us? Because they matter to Jesus. Literally. Kids and youth, they matter to Jesus. Today, we're talking about spiritual growth is healthy. Let's pray. Lord, over these next few minutes as we dig into your word, I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive all that you have for us. Father, if there's anybody in this room that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, that over these next few minutes that you would just move and speak and draw their hearts to you in a relationship. Lord, for those of us that know you, help us to know you more deeply. Help us to continually make forward progress in our relationship with you. We offer this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, as you study the Gospels, you'll notice that where we find Peter in the beginning of Matthew is not where we find Peter in First and Second Peter, right? 
Where you find Paul in Acts on the road to Damascus is not where you find Paul in the epistles that he wrote at the end of the New Testament. Why? Because they made forward spiritual movement. Peter, the apostle Peter, was not qualified at the beginning to write First and Second Peter. He had to go through a lot of stuff. But the point is, he went through the stuff. And you're going to go through stuff too. And all that stuff we go through shapes us and makes us who God wants us to be. We see that through the disciples, the 12, that 11 of them chose spiritual growth, right? 11 of them chose to move on. They didn't grab the ball and sit. They moved forward with it. One of them chose, instead of spiritual growth, he chose sinful greed. And, and, and sinful greed for Judas was about money. But come on, y'all. Sinful greed for some of us, it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with greed, getting what I want, living my way. Me, 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 right? So what are we going to be with? That's our choice. In this sense, spiritual growth is not about knowing more Bible. Listen very carefully. Spiritual growth is not about knowing more Bible so you do good on trivia night. Like on trivia nights, I'm always hoping that they have a Bible portion because I'm thinking like, dude, I'm going to nail that one. If they got a sports thing, I'm lost. If they got a car thing, who cares, you know? But, but give me a Bible or history or books. I'm like, I'm all in with those three. Spiritual growth doesn't have anything to do with your knowledge, but that's an outcome, right? Like as you know Jesus more and more, as you walk with him, you're going to know more about him. As you walk with Jesus, you're going to read his word. The outcome is going to be that you're going to know more of God's word. You might do better on Bible trivia, you know. That's not the goal though. The goal is to know Jesus, to make him known. The goal is that each and every day and each and every situation, I represent Jesus. That's the goal. It's not so I know more, so I look better, and so that people think highly of me. The goal is that in every day and in every situation, I represent Jesus to a lost and hurting world. This morning, we're going to look at three things, not five things. Say thank you. Thank you. Like this is going to be a, a good sermon. I'm not going to preach for an hour today. We're going to look at three things that we need to know about spiritual growth. Three things. The first thing, the call to spiritual growth. You are called to spiritual growth. Amen. The call. Let's look at the book of Matthew or Mark. Mark chapter 1. Mark 1, the, the scriptures will be up on the screen. Mark 1, 16 through 18, it says, One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon, Peter, right? Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Here's what he said, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A couple of things we want to pull out of this passage. Such a, a good passage. He is the initiator. Jesus is the initiator. The call to discipleship, he initiates, I follow. That's it. He initiates and I say yes and I come. He is the initiator. Um, Listen, it's not a meet and greet either. When Jesus meets these two brothers on the seashore, it's not like you get a VIP pass to a concert, Diane, right? Where you got to go and who was this band that you saw? Phil Wickham. Phil Wickham. Oh, that's not a bad. He's awesome. She got a VIP pass and her and her sister got to go backstage and got to talk to him. And then you got in your car and you came back home. Right? Or no, you didn't. You went. Okay. Then you went to a concert. Whatever. Gosh. Yeah, you got to see him. I, I was thinking it was afterwards. The VIP pass, though, the, this is more than Jesus saying, here's a VIP pass. You get to meet me up close and personal. He's saying, come follow me. Like, don't just come meet and greet. Like, tomorrow, meet and greet. And the next day, you're going to come with me. And the next day, you're going to come with me. He is the initiator. For you and for me, Jesus is more than likely not going to come to our workplace and say, hey, Quentin, I want you to come follow me, right? Like, but that's what he did to these guys. Literally, it was their workplace. But what does he do instead for us? He sends his Holy Spirit. So P Peter and his brother Andrew, they're fishing, they're doing their job, and Jesus meets them and, and initiates this invitation for them to come follow him. For you, it's probably not going to look like him walking down the halls of your work, but it's going to be the Holy Spirit. 
Because remember, Jesus says, it's good for you that I leave. Because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit who's going to live with you. And later on, he's going to be in you. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. He takes up residence in your life. That's what he does. But until then, it is the Holy Spirit that is working in the world, drawing people to salvation. So Jesus is the, the Holy Spirit is the initiator and we respond. What else do we see in this scripture? The call to spiritual growth. He's the leader. He is the initiator, but he's also the leader. And what does he say? He says, follow me. He doesn't just say, he doesn't really say, come walk beside me. He says, follow me. It's important to remember who's in charge, isn't it? How many of you guys remember the 80s sitcom, Who's the Boss? Fun, kind of a fun sitcom. I remember that. Um, my dad was the master of the remote when we were kids because we had one TV and he was the master of the remote. So there was MacGyver and A Team. But man, every now and then we got the remote and we got to watch something like Who's the Boss? What was so fun was that Tony and Angela, um, the reason the show got its name was because their roles were reversed in society where she was the major breadwinner and he was the one who stayed home and took care of the house. And it was kind of this running theme throughout the show. Who's the boss? Listen, in your life, who is the boss? You may not see, like, like sometimes we forget he's really the boss. And in this discipleship relationship, this journey that I have with Jesus, man, when I met him at eight, I've been walking with Jesus 40 years. Like, I just told you how old I am. I don't even care. 40 years I've walked with Jesus. And for a lot of those years, I kind of got things flipped where instead of me following behind, I was walking beside him. But he's the leader. Why would I walk beside him? I want to follow close to him. I've heard it said that... um, Jesus is the boss, and if you don't like the way he runs his universe, go get your own, right? If you don't like the way he does things, go get your own universe. Go create your own community, your own people group. He's the boss. He's the leader. My job is to follow close behind. What else do we see? The call to discipleship. He's the initiator. I come. He's the leader, and I follow. But what else? He's the instructor. Because what does he say? He says, I will show you. He's, he's not just a catch and release side sort of leader, right? Where he says, come follow me, walk with me for a day and then figure it out on your own. Instead, they walk with him. They see what he does. So Jesus calls them. And what does he do? This is so cool. He uses language that these men understand. Because that he was so creative. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't say, follow me and I will make you bankers. I will make, like he uses language and words and skills that these people already have. How wonderful that he doesn't just tell us to follow him and then back off. And have you ever had a, had a job where you started and they told you kind of how to do it and then they just walked away and you did all of us, yeah. right? And you just had, you just were like, I'll figure this out on my own. And it took me, it took me a month or two, even here, I was thinking about this this week, Brent, when I was thinking about the service order, and I thought, man, I I was remembering back to that first week, like, I didn't know how to use some of our technology, and I just kind of had to figure it out, and I asked for help here and there, but Jesus doesn't do that to us. What does he do? Instead, he told them to come follow him, love people, serve people, give, go. And then he showed them how to love people, how to serve people, how to give, how to go. Then he released them. These guys had three and a half years of training, on-the-job training, where Jesus shows them what it looks like to be a true disciple. And then he releases them. So the call to discipleship. You ready for another thought? Thank you. If you're if you are with me, I'm going to preach better. So y'all with me? Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. The challenge of spiritual growth. Every one of us are smart enough to know if you've walked with Jesus for any length of time, there is a challenge in it. And I would be an awful pastor if I wasn't honest with you about it. There is a challenge, right? What's the saying go? If it was easy, everyone would do it. Following Jesus is the best thing I've ever done in my life. But there are days where it's hard. There are days where being a truly spiritual growing disciple of Jesus 
there are some challenges. Let's look at the book of Matthew, chapter 8, verse 18 through 22. It says, when Jesus saw the crowd around him, he instructed his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. Then one of the teachers of religious law said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. Another of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Jesus challenged these two wannabe followers. They were, they, they were wannabe followers. They wanted to follow Jesus. As I, um, I, I was reading this, I was just trying to think this week, what's re Jesus really saying? What are they really offering and what is Jesus really saying? What is he really challenging them in this? Um, so character one, let's look at this. Character one. He says, I'm going to follow you anywhere you go. Jesus, and Jesus' reply is, I don't even have a bed. That's kind of funny to me. Like, I think Jesus is, I, I, uh, sometimes we think of Jesus as, as stoic and personalityless. I think Jesus had a personality. Listen, if you and I are made in the image of God, come on, Linda. I know, like, you're a character. <laughs> Linda, you're made in the image of God. Imago Dei, you are made in the image of God, which tells me that some of who you are comes from your father, right? Your DNA, like your DNA passed on to your kid. You're my heavenly father. You're his kid. And if I've got a personality, you got a personality, we got to believe that Jesus is this perfect blend of all of the intricacies of us, right? Better stated, we are a blend of all of his intricacies. He's not a blend of us. We're a blend of who he is. Character one, I'm going to go with you anywhere you go. And Jesus said, I don't got a bed. I don't even have a bed. Foxes have, have holes. By the way, there was a fox on my back porch the other day. It was so cool. Playing a game with my family. And Ruby says, is that a cat? Like, we're literally like four feet away. And I said, that's a fox. And then, I don't know what made us do it, but we so badly wanted to see it, so we put food out <laughs> because we wanted it to come back because I just wanted to see it. It was so cool. This reminds me, though, of, have you ever known someone, they come to Jesus and they are excited, they are pumped, they're like, man, I want to do anything for Jesus. I'll go to Africa, I'll do anything. And then they fizzle out. That, like, we've known people like that. What, how, why is that? Because they're not doing the small disciplines in their life. They're not following in the basic things. And so they fizzle out. But I love that Jesus didn't tell the man no. Right? When he's like, I'm going to follow you anywhere. He doesn't say, no, you're not. He, he instead, he shows them the cost. That, that I don't even have a bed. Are you sure? Jesus didn't cancel him and say no to him. What about our character to our second wannabe? He says, I'm coming too. But first, let me go home and bury my dad. Instead, what he, what's he really saying there? He's not saying that his dad is actually dead and that he needs to go dig a hole and put his body in. Uh, and as I was studying this week, different theologians have different takes on why he said this. Um, here's my take. Could it, be, could it be that this man was saying, my dad is old, he's almost dead, let me go home, and when he dies, I'm going to bury him, and then I'll have my inheritance, and then I'm set to follow you. Could that be? There, there's no, I mean, we don't know exactly, because like I said, everyone has different opinions and thoughts for what he was really saying and why he said that. To me, that makes so much sense, because in their culture, in our culture even, when your parents die, you get the inheritance, and hopefully it's not just you're inheriting debt or junk, right? So, so that's what he says. But what does Jesus reply? He said, now. Listen to what Jesus said. But Jesus told him, follow me now. Not when you are financially secure. Not when you get things sorted out. Not when you're older. Listen, teenagers, here's what I, I know teenagers think this. They th and even if you look at the Amish community, they have the, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it? room spring up, something like that where they go and they sow their wild oats for a while because when they're older once they've experienced life then they'll make that choice man listen what does Jesus say he doesn't say wait till you're older then you follow me Jesus says to this man now 
If you want to be his disciple and you want to follow Jesus, why are you waiting? Like, how uh, do you want to live with years of regret? Because that's what will happen. I mean, honestly, how many of us adults in this room know what that's like? You've lived with years of regret because of the, the years that you spent following your own path, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. You, you live with years of regret. Don't wait. Jesus says, follow me and do it now. Let's look at, real quick at what are some challenges to spiritual growth? Like I said, this is, we talked about the call to spiritual growth. What are some of the challenges? Because there are challenges in this passage. The challenge of the world. The scripture told us that Jesus saw the crowd. He saw the crowd around them. Spiritual growth requires sometimes for us to leave the crowd. It does. Have you ever been behind a truck? Um, I remember when I first noticed this, I thought that's a weird thing for a truck to say when they would say, it would say construction vehicle, do not follow or do not follow into work site. I thought, well, that's dumb. Why would anyone follow into a, a work site? But haven't you ever been going down the road in your mirror, on your merry little way, not even thinking about what you were doing and you noticed that you missed your exit or you were following someone into a work site? Why is that? Because we zone out, we, we lose attention, we lose track of what we're doing, and we follow what's in front of us sometimes because we get lulled into complacency. This is a challenge for a disciple. If you want to be a disciple of Jesus, you're going to have to pay attention. Sometimes you're going to have to leave the crowd that you're walking in. What else? The challenge of the unknown. Jesus says, I, I have no place to lay my head, doesn't he? He, he talks about, I, I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow is really what he's saying. That the challenge of the unknown, Jesus fortunately and unfortunately doesn't give us a blueprint for our life. If he gave me a blueprint, I'd probably be freaked out and maybe wouldn't follow it. That's why we call it a walk of faith. Literally, it's called like I'm saved and I have a walk of faith because I'm continuously walking it out. I may not know what's going to happen tomorrow, but man, when I'm walking with Jesus, I know that I'm walking with him. So whatever comes my way tomorrow, I know I've got, the scripture tells me I had a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Another challenge, the challenge of the uncomfortable. Uh, the scripture tells us that Jesus, like he used a rock to lay his head on. Come on, I like my $90 pillow. I, I, I invested in a good pillow a few years ago. I'm so glad I did. I invested in a good bed. The challenge of being uncomfortable. Have you ever been in a room with people, a bunch of people, and they weren't following Jesus, and they were doing some things that maybe made you uncomfortable? Here's what I notice. When they know that I'm a pastor, usually I'm the one making them uncomfortable. <laughs> Lonnie and I were at one of his work functions a few weeks ago, and we were in St. Louis, and uh, they, had, they had a meal and an open bar. Man, these, these people were getting hammered, weren't they? And I'm just sitting there like, I just thought, they are, they're loud. Like, they're loud and weird. And, and, and then I went up to go get water or get a Diet Pepsi at the bar. And of course, a bartender looks at you like you're a weirdo when you go get a, a Diet Pepsi. And while I was gone, they asked Lonnie, so what does your wife do? And he said, she's a pastor. And I'm like, oh, you know, because I made them uncomfortable. Sometimes for you, listen, if you, if you start your journey with Jesus, some of the people that maybe you did life with before, they might be a little uncomfortable at your life. And that's okay. They're, that's the challenge of discipleship. What's the last thing? The challenge of other people's expectations. Families put expectations on us, don't they? I, I know this. I know families have expectations. What does the man say? He says, first, let me go home and bury my dad. First, let me go home and take care of business. Um, I, you know, we knew a lady in uh, Nebraska. She was, I think, one of 10 or 11 kids. And she, when she came to know Jesus, man, she, she was full in. She, all the chips on the table, she was following Jesus for all she had. But her other nine or ten siblings were not. And they would plan all these events on Sunday mornings. And she finally just told them, look, this is, this is non-negotiable for me. This is priority. And if, it, if you have a, an event on Sunday, I will gladly come at noon. She, she made her expect, she, she knew the expectations that they had for her and she made it clear that this is 
what is important to me. And I will gladly come and celebrate your, 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 her 40th nephew's birthday, whatever, you know, because there was so out of nine or 10 kids and they were all very prolific, a very breeding family. So she just made it known that this is my priority and this is what I'm going to do. Listen, sometimes following Jesus, that's a challenge. Man, I'm up for it though. I got, I've got, I know that there are family expectations on all of us, but it's up to you to decide what is important in your life. What is important for you? What is important for your family? Last thing we want to look at. We talked about the call to discipleship, the challenge of discipleship. Let's talk about the characteristics, though, of someone who is spiritually growing. What are some of those characteristics? Um, Matthew chapter 16, 24, it shows us there's a forsaking forsaking it is turning your back on something a person who's growing spiritually is one who is willing to turn their back on certain ways of living and I am not oh hear me out this is not about religion right I've said this before religion is all about what you do for God right but the gospel is all about what he did for you do you, I mean, like, tattoo that on your arm. That's something to remind yourself and live by, okay? Listen, forsaking, though. Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you, that means that it's open to all of us, not just the elite few, not just the few who are willing to, you know, who jump through hoops, but if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. As a disciple, one of the characteristics of my life is that I've forsaken some things. There are some things that I don't do. Like I said, it's not about a list of do's and don'ts. But because I love my Jesus, there are going to be some things that I don't do. There just are. There's some things I'm not going to say. There's some things I'm not going to watch. There's some places I'm not going to go. When we were uh, at his work function, it was at the Ameristar Resort and Casino and I said, let's just go stand. Let's just go look at the casino. I just wanted to look. And I just stood outside and I just, oh, my heart just grieved for these people. I just, I always stood there probably 10 minutes just staring like one lady sitting at a machine pushing the button for 10 minutes. Just felt hopeless. Listen, because I love my Jesus, I'm not going to do that. It's just, it's a choice I've made. I, I'm going to be wise with my money, but I also, I'm not, I know my personality too. Uh, there's something to this, guys. You know your personality. If you know that you have an addictive personality, a drink will not be a drink. I, I mean, a $10 on a slot machine may not be, if you're an addictive person, $10, you might, I, I, I know we use the excuse, it's just $10 of fun. I would spend $10 at a movie. And if you can do that, rock, rock yourself, like do that. I can't. I know myself way too much that if I'm going to do that, it's not going to be $10. It's going to be $20. It's going to be $30. And we know this because we went on a cruise like 22 years ago. We're in the middle of the water in the ocean. And, and this was, I worked on staff at a church in Des Moines and wonderful church, but it was a big church. So no matter where you went in town, there were church people everywhere. You just, I mean, I couldn't, I, I had to be careful everything I did because there'd be some kid yelling across the lake, literally, Pastor Amy! I cried, I just can't go anywhere. So I said, babe, we're in the middle of the ocean. Can I just go? I just want to know what, what, what people are getting kicks out of in that casino. Like, and he's like, all right, Amy, it's like $20. I'm like, so I, said, I said, I promise that's all I'll do, like a child. And so we get in there, and I'm put, and this was back when coins, you know, when you popped coins in. And man, my $20 was gone in no time. And what did I do? I said, please, can I have some of yours, please? Just a little bit more, a little bit more. Because I know who I am. Like $10 wasn't enough. $20 isn't enough. And you know who you are too. I know beyond my personality, beyond just that character trait, I know that I belong to Jesus. And listen, I'm not, I want to be so careful that I don't want to do something that's going to cause somebody else to stumble and sin. All right. There is a forsaking involved. That's a characteristic. Fruitfulness. Come on. Now let's talk about something really good. Fruitfulness. 
A person that is growing fruitful, that, that is walking with Jesus, that is growing in their relationship with Jesus as a follower of Christ, as a disciple, they will produce fruit in their life. John 15, 8 says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. When you walk with Jesus, you will produce fruit. We know what the fruit is in Galatians, the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Some of you were singing it in your head because that's how many of us learned it. Those, that fruit of the Spirit, the longer you walk with Jesus, the more fruit you're going to develop in your life. Philippians 1.11, I love this. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. A disciple, a follower of Jesus is going to develop fruit in their life. What's another characteristic? Faithfulness. You show me a person that is growing in their walk with Jesus, and I will show you a person that is faithful in the spiritual disciplines. Now, the reverse is true. And let me just turn it on me instead of pointing a finger at you. The times in my life where I know that I am not, I am not thriving in my walk with Jesus, the times what I am, where I feel dry and cold, look at my spiritual disciplines. That's how I'm going to know. Why do I feel this way? It's because I'm not being faithful to the Lord in those disciplines. What am I talking about? Listen, the discipline of praying every day. I'd be lying to you if I said every morning I wake up and I can't wait to pray. I, there are many mornings I would rather sleep. Come on, I'm human. I'm not super Saint Amy. Like, there are many mornings I would rather push snooze. But a spiritual discipline is prayer. And so am I praying when, I'm, when I feel like I'm stagnant in my walk with Jesus or worse yet, when I feel like I'm backsliding, I'm going backwards? Look at the spiritual discipline. Am I reading the word of God? Am I actively reading and growing in my knowledge of Jesus through reading his word? Am I faithful to church? Am I faithful to relationships and loving people? 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, and I wanted to read it from the Good News Translation. It says, you should think of us as Christ's servants who have been put in charge of God's secret truths. The one thing required of such servants is that they be faithful to their master being faithful to the master. Freedom. What's another characteristic? And we're almost done. Freedom. Freedom from a life of sin. I just, I just want you to know, you can have freedom from a life of sin. Amen. The Lord can set you free from addiction. He can set you free from, he can set you free from alcohol. He, I know people. You guys, I'm not just saying, like, I'm, it doesn't just sound good. I know people. Jesus has set them free from drugs. I, I live, I, I'm family with those people. He can set you free from drugs. He can set you free from alcohol. He can set you free from porn. Like there is freedom for someone who is growing closer to Jesus. John 8, 31 says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Most of us just say the truth will set us free. Not true. It is the truth that you know that will set you free. What did it say? And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth you don't know isn't going to do anything for you. It is the truth you know. But what did he say? You will abide in my word. The truth you know will set you free. Last thought, friendship. Where spiritual growth is happening, it will happen within community. Spiritual growth is not going to happen in isolation. Now, if you're a Bible scholar like some of you in the room, you might say, well, what about the Apostle Paul? He was in isolation a lot. This dude was in prison. He had spiritual growth in prison because sometimes beautiful things grow in dark places. That's true. Sometimes that happens. But Paul grew in spite of isolation, not because of isolation. Important distinction. He grew in spite of it. But if you look at the letters of Paul in the end of the New Testament, he, what is he doing? He's constantly in communication with the churches that he helped start. So though he may be in isolation because it was required of him because he's in the clink, the whole time he's in jail, he is still in communication with his friends, with the people that he had relationship. His growth happened in spite of, not because of it. And I'm not going to take time to read it, but Acts chapter 2 
if you ever hear someone use the phrase, the New Testament church, you know, like, well, the New Testament church, I, I, in the church world, I hear that a lot. Acts chapter 2, the last part of the verse, of the chapter, it is talking about how after Jesus dies, he raises from the dead, he spends weeks with his disciples, and he teaches them, and then he ascends back into heaven. He tells them to go wait in Jerusalem for power from on high, which is the Holy Spirit. In that time, this is happening after the Holy Spirit comes on, on the people. After the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it, it, G, the Holy Spirit was present on the earth. Listen, the Holy Spirit from creation. Go to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, the, what did we see? That the, Holy, the Spirit hovered over the deep. The Holy Spirit didn't just get born in Acts chapter 1 and 2. But the Holy Spirit manifests in a new way in Acts chapter 1 and 2, right? So we see, though, after the Holy Spirit is given, the church is, is born. That's the birth of the church. And what happens, I'll just read a little bit. All the believers, they devoted them, themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. And they shared at meals, like what you will do in a small group in our homes, right? Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over all of them. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. Let me bump down to verse 47. 46, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while, what was the result of this? All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to the fellowship to those who were being saved. A mark of someone who is growing spiritually is they have friends. Can I just tell you, like, church is not a bore. If you're bored in church, you're doing something wrong. I mean, I, you're not involved. Something's ha like some, you're not involved serving. You're not involved in fellowship because that's not the church I know. I, I, I love the relationships that I have here. Did you know this? Let me talk to you. I, in, clo in closing, I'll give you hope right there. In closing, that's, what, that's the preacher's cue that I'm wrapping it up and I'm giving you hope so don't fall asleep. In closing, there's a study about trees. There's a study about trees, how, um, and, and this study happened at Shinsu University in Japan. And what they did was they had a plot of land, they had two plots of land. And in one plot of land, they let the trees grow. These were giant cedar trees. They let the trees grow as they were. They didn't thin the, the forest. And then the, the, the other plot of land, they removed some of the trees so that there was more space between the trees. Well, as it comes to happen in September of 2018, there was a Category 5, I think it was um, a typhoon. A Category 5 typhoon comes in and what they noticed what scientists noticed as a result of that typhoon was that the one the test the test plot and the sample plot both of these plots they observed these plots to see how did the trees do you would think that the the plot of land where there was more room for the trees to grow would have been better but that's not how it played out instead what they noticed was that was the part of land that got the most damage where there was more space between trees, the winds came and knocked them down. It was the plot, the, the section of land where the trees were close together. Because guess what's happening? They're supporting each other. And, and that's, like, that's beautiful. That's beautiful that those trees were there to support and bring establishment to each other. Man, we're like that tree. We're like those trees. And it's up to you. It's up to you what you do. It's up to you. Are you going to be a tree that's going to be deeply rooted and planted with other trees so that when things come and blow your way, you've got someone to lean on for support? Are you going to do it by yourself? Because I don't need people and I don't need relationships. I'm just fine. I'm sad for you if that's your way. I'm sad for you because that's not the way of, of Scripture. We want to be a church of people who are growing in their faith growing together. It starts, though, spiritual growth it starts with the first thing I talked about, answering the call. That's where it all starts. It starts with answering the call and saying yes to Jesus. Yes, I will follow you. Would you stand with me?
Lord Jesus, I thank you this morning that just like you called the disciples in the Bible, even now your Holy Spirit calls us. I thank you, Jesus, that you love us where we are, but you love us so much that you don't leave us. Instead, you draw and you call us by your Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask that right this moment in this room that you would be moving and that you would be drawing people into a deep relationship with you. I'm going to ask you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a minute. And I just want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you're here today and you felt a tugging and a pull in your heart. That is not eloquent words from this girl. That is the Holy Spirit moving. You cannot see him, but we know that he is moving in this earth. We know that his job is to draw people's hearts to him. And if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Amy, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I am ready. I sense the Holy Spirit drawing me and calling me, and I'm ready to say yes. He is initiating relationship with you, and he is waiting for you to respond to him. If that's you and you have never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you've never said yes to that call, would you lift your hand? I want to pray with you. I promise you this. We will not embarrass you. I will not call you out. I will not do anything to embarrass you. But I will give you a chance to follow Jesus, to say yes to his call. Is there anybody in this room today? I see that. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? You are ready. You are ready. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? You're ready to say yes to Jesus. You want to know him as Lord and Savior. Anybody else? I'll give you another few seconds. All right. All right. Listen, if you raised your hand, we're going to pray this prayer.